going to be a nice day up there. Where we're going, it's a bit different. We make an early start in the coal mines, seven o'clock in the morning. So in winter time, we don't see much of the sun before we go down the pit. It's a job that's very different from any surface work. It takes a bit of getting used to. It's usually too hot or too cold for comfort. It's dirty, dusty, and dark. And the air's none too sweet. But at least you're out of the rain. In most mines, you ride only as far as pit bottom. From there to your working place, you walk. Maybe a mile, maybe two, or even three. The tunnel follows the coal seam deep into the earth. When you get to your place, the work of winning the coal begins. The old pick and shovel days are on the way out. Now the pits are being mechanized at last. The mine worker of today is more than a hewer of coal, a filler of tubs. He's an engineer and technician as well. It takes skill and experience to handle these roaring eight-ton cutters with their hundred whirling picks. The 10-foot blade of this machine makes a series of cuts in the coal face to loosen the coal so it'll break out easy when it's fired down later. keep the machines moving and the paces fast. Today, more coal is produced by fewer men than ever before. In some seams, up to 2,000 tons a ship. When the coal cutting is done, the machines move on to the next board. And the drillers move into this one. Deep holes are drilled into the standing coal, ready for the shot firer to fill with explosives. shot down is loaded out. Driving a snout into the shattered heap, the powerful steel claws of the automatic loader rake up the coal onto an elevating conveyor and dump it into the shuttle cars behind. As the coal comes out, the maintenance gang moves in. Their job is to shore up the roof, to hold up the gigantic pressures of thousands of tons of rock and strata above. For every foot the tunnel is driven forward into the seam, the timber supports must follow close behind. You have to work fast, and you work as a team. In seams 30 foot high with timbers like telegraph poles, you work. Cutting, firing, and loading throughout the shift, the machines go in their turn from place to place, and from pit bottom the coal streams up to the surface by the thousand tons on the long conveyor belts.
When your eight hours are up and you're on the way out, you're not sorry. It's good to get out of the heat and noise and dust. It's long enough to work in a hole in the ground. It's good to come out into the sun, see the sky and the trees, feel the warmth and the wind on your face, see the color of the world again. You see the coal that you've won on its way down to the waiting furnace to make heat, light and power. Coal power to generate electricity, to heat and light millions of homes. Steam power for expanding industries. For steel plant, foundry, factory, and powerhouse. from the earth for tomorrow's new industry which will crack the atom in the black rock and take out of the coal itself its hundreds of chemical byproducts for rubber, plastics, fertilizer, fuels, acids, dyes, drugs, resins, oils. Here in Australia a potential yet untapped there's another side to the story of coal, a not so pretty one. The story of an endless trail of wreck and ruin and wasted coal resources. Coal half worked, coal abandoned and lost. On every major field they lie, the bones of many mines, a trail of rusting iron, rubble and rotting posts cave-ins and water-filled craters, more like battlefields than coal fields, millions of tons of coal abandoned and lost. At the beginning of this century, coal was booming. The country was expanding. Its power needs growing. The deposits are rich and plentiful, the mining expert said. The coal is the highest quality. Rich and volatile, so beware of spontaneous combustion. Plan the underground workings wisely, so that fires can be sealed off quickly without great loss of coal. But coal was in demand, and the shafts went down wherever there was coal, with little thought or planning for the country as a whole. Low cost extraction of the best coal first was the system. Take it out fast and take it out cheap. Take it out by the hundred thousand tons. On the coal fields, the mining towns were growing. In one industry towns, our lives revolve around the pit. And if we hewed out our dag of 20 tons of coal a day, we got a living enough to pay the rent and keep the family going. We built our churches and homes, our schools and pubs and stores, and raised families here. Coal was bread and butter to us, and a black pint or two to wash the coal dust from our throats. In these early days, you had to find all your own tools and gear. Picks and shovels, hand drills and explosives, water bottle, crib can, matches, and tallow for your lamp. The tiny flame from your cap lamp was your only source of light underground. Down the pit it was plain hard work for a contract miner. Hard work with primitive tools. Long hours in bad air hot and dangerous conditions. 
Right from the start, the experts' warnings went unheeded. The way the coal owners laid out the workings would make a pit horse lose his way. There was such a maze of tunnels and cut-throughs. Take out the coal wherever you can get it, was what they insisted on. Keep the road short. The deeper you go, the dearer it gets. Branch off to the left, branch off to the right. Take it out fast and cheap. Fire was always a trouble. Bad methods caused pressures and heatings. Spontaneous combustion. When the coal caught fire, you had to seal it off fast, try and starve it of air, and branch off somewhere else. Fires added to ordinary hazards made some pits death traps. Accidents were common. If you were lucky, your pit sense warned you in time. Sometimes it happened too quick. remember our 20 mates who were carried up dead from Bellbird. At Mount Mulligan, 75 more. Bulleye, 81. Mount Kembler, 95 dead. Dudley, Burwood, Balmain, Lithgow, Greta, and all the rest. We took out the coal by the 100,000 tons but at what a cost to life and limb. In one industry towns, there were plenty of ups and downs for a miner and his family. We knew what it was like to be at the mercy of the price of coal. If the price dropped or the demand fell off, we were out of a job for a while, maybe six months, maybe a year. In depression years, we lived from day to day while the owners wrangled for fading markets. If the mine closed down, it was pack up and move on. Try and start all over again. Leave the dead towns behind. In better times, coal boomed again. Our towns grew bigger and prospered with the pits. We organized and battled for our rights, improved our wages and work conditions, demanded better safety conditions. When there was work, we worked. We took it out by the 100,000 tons. For many years, the rich coal was torn out of the earth in the northern fields, the southern, and the west. From Newcastle to Kayama, from Lithgow to Wonthaggy. We took it out by the 100,000 tons. But for every ton extracted, some five were left behind, caved in, too deep, too costly, on fire, sealed off, abandoned, and lost. We took it out by the 100,000 tons. But in many mines, in many fields, danger signs were growing. Surface cave in and earth collapse. Underground fires out of control. Danger signs of deep concern to those who earned their living in the pits. Down below, crush and creep. The ominous sound of thousands of tons of strata working sliding, trying to find its own level. And coal on fire. Every pit on the northern field had coal on fire. Acrid smoke and deadly fumes poisoning the air. More tunnels to seal off again. 
In pits that were badly planned, you sometimes sealed off with the fire half the underground workings. Sealed off for good some of the best coal that ever blackened a miner's face. If a fire can't get air through the seals, it sometimes draws it down through the earth and keeps burning. Bursting from the ground like a holocaust, this fire in the Greta Coal Measures in 1946 burned for three days and nights and consumed thousands of tons of coal before it was extinguished. More of the nation's coal resources going up in smoke. took it out by the hundred thousand tons. But more was destroyed or left behind than was ever taken out. In an eight mile stretch from Maitland to Curry, nine mines were abandoned with only 5% of the coal extracted. Ripped out, burnt out, flooded, abandoned, and lost. And so the trail of wreckage grew. When the mines closed down, the towns that lived and thrived beside them died. Neath, Abernethy, Glen Davis, Minmai, Greta. Ghost towns now. Where are they now? The ones who built this town. We took it out by the hundred thousand tons in the north, the south, and west. We took it out by the hundred thousand tons and the trail of wreckage grew. There was always the road. Pack up, move off somewhere else. Branch off to the left, branch off to the right. For the ones who owned the mines, coal was business, profit and loss, investment and quick return. Our methods are wasteful, the experts say, destroying the nation's assets. But to lay out and work a mine the way the experts say costs money. And who's going to bear the costs? Too long to wait for profits. Too long to wait for returns. We'll have to write this one off. Abandon it and move to the next one. Plenty more good coal left. Branch off to the left. Branch off to the right. The investors expect results. Nineteen thirty nine, war. On the home front, coal boomed again. Increased production demanded. For heavy industry geared up for intense war effort, coal was the power to make the steel, to make the guns, a sinew of war, a powerful defense. The nation needed coal as never before. The miners produced the coal produced it from pits ill-equipped to meet the demand, many dangerously run down by years of neglect. With the high coal productivity went the highest accident and fatality rate on record. But they produced the coal. With muscle and toil and sweat, they produced the coal through six years of war. Coal was a power for heat and light. A power for victory. Nineteen forty five brought peace and celebration to the world. But a new crisis for the mine workers and their families. 
Intense production had turned to overproduction now. Mountains of coal at grass. For the miners, the surplus coal was a threat to livelihood. And on the horizon, another steadily growing threat. Cheap fuel oil from America challenging coal as a fuel. A problem for the coal owners too, how to compete with oil. How to get cheaper coal from mines run down by 50 years of profit-ruled methods. The owners found their solution. Investments were at stake. They were forced to modernize and mechanize the pits. No alternative. We must produce coal cheaper, speed up production, employ fewer men, bring down more machines. One machine will do the work of 20 men. Bring down the electric coal cutter, a push button miner with a hundred picks in one hand. Sack the men with the shovels and bring down the electric loader. Take the coal out faster, cheaper. Drive out the small competitors. If they can't afford to mechanize, they'll have to close down, that's all. That's healthy competition. The small mines went to the wall, and some big ones too, and unemployment struck again. What about us? Where do we go from here? We're tired of the road. It's a road to nowhere with nothing at the end. We've traveled too many roads already, been cabled out, burnt out and sold out many times. We're getting tired of moving on, damn tired. Our roots are here, our homes are here. We grew up here, married here. Here's where our kids were born. Here's where we belong. Today, the crisis on the coal fields grows. Pit after pit closing down, machines displacing the men. Thousands more mine workers facing the prospect of losing jobs, homes and possessions with no other work to turn to. What of the future? What have we got to look forward to, the miners and their spokesmen ask? Mass unemployment again? Bigger and better ghost towns? Why should there be unemployment, they ask? The coal's still there, the best coal in the world. The production rate is higher than ever before. But the machines which should bring prosperity bring unemployment instead. In three short years, 40 pits closed down. 3,000 men dismissed. In many fields, they're saying the time has come for action. They demand a sensible plan to avert the growing crisis, to save what's left of the coal from waste and total destruction. Time someone took a stand, they're saying. Where's it all leading, they ask. No future in this for anyone. Where's the sense, they want to know. There's nothing but chaos ahead. The hewers of coal are demanding some security for tomorrow. And they're on the march for it. Coal's not finished by a long shot. Not if we've got a say in it. Here's our plan to deal with the crisis. So you've got more coal than you can burn, coal at grass. There's plenty you can do with coal besides burn it. Utilize coal, use coal to the full. Set up more industries to take out the valuable extracts, the chemicals, the rubber, the plastics, things we have to import. It's done in other countries. Why can't we do it here? We dug those mines and we'll work them but we want an end of waste and reckless methods. Bring on the machines, we welcome them. About time the back break was taken out of mining. We'll tame those iron monsters and make them talk. Talk a language that means a better deal. Shorter working hours, more leisure time with the kids, less time in the pit. That's what the machines should bring. We say nationalize the mines. That's the plan we're putting forward to make the best use of coal for us all. We want an end to the black record of coal. An end of destruction and waste of the nation's coal resources. This is the way forward as we see it. Put the coal in safer hands.
there's still plenty of coal to be won. Broad acres of virgin fields untouched. Enough to last a thousand years if we take it out the right way. Power in the land. Untapped power in plenty to open up the country for peaceful development. A power for tomorrow. Coal should belong to the nation. It's right and heritage. There's enough to last a thousand years if we make the best use of it. If its future is in the right hands. In the hands of the Australian people. Thank you.